you welcome again to our series on literature so what lsw i'm sure you must have been finding this channel quite interesting in the sense of opening us up to certain ideas certain issues that we might not have been very very cognizant of and um, i hope that this has been a time to write on literature and literary theory and cultural studies in a very very interesting and meaning making way something we can call intelligible now today we are going into an exploration on structuralism structuralism is a theory in literature and it happens to be a theory in a number of cultural products that they are structuralists that began to be the high flyers of this theory, you know, engaged in. Structuralism has to do with a way of looking at literature as a part of semiology, that is, a part of a kind of system, a science that looks at signs. Signs are understood as products of meaning cultural meaning that have value to society and so when we talk about signs in this context we are talking about anything that has an attribute of meaning making not just at the level of a very surface meaning that everybody consumes but even at a very deeper structural level but before i come into that i want us to look at what structuralism is all about well, structuralism is a literary theory that had a historical um, a background and reacting to certain things that were consistent within a previous relation with literature that was definitely socially and culturally informed. When structuralism started as a theory in the early 20th century, it was reacting against certain notions that were practiced not only in academia, in our context in the humanities, but also in the way society was understood within the space structuralism started. Structuralism can be seen as a literary theory we can privilege to have begun in its very defined manner in France. And the scholar attributed to have begun, you know, a thinking in a structuralist form was a man called Ferdinand de Saussure. He happened to be a linguist and in 1916, he published a book he called Course in General Linguistics. In that particular book, he was reacting to the idea that was informed by the new critics that literature can best be consumed and taken in a high formalist sense based on certain notions of great literature that had uh, you know the links of some pioneer canonical texts with their elements of literary beauty and their ideas of rhetoric in other words to a very great extent structuralism begun by Ferdinand de Saussure was a way of breaking down literature away from what we can call a bourgeois production of the new critics. They depended on you know, the idea of literature as having a formalist consistency of aesthetics, of decorum, and of course, literary sense, which was only seen as a handover of a kind of imaginary of great uh, literary tradition. But then in uh, Ferdinand de Saussure's case, coming from the background of linguistics, he was looking at literature as something that can be studied in itself, in its structural elements. In other words, it has no affinity to a particular tradition coming from a particular history that is saw as bourgeois. When we talk about something bourgeois, in our contemporary sense, we mean something elitist. But it's a word that even came from a French source. And it had a historical underpinning in which 
okay, just before the French Revolution, you had three classes, major classes of society. You had the aristocracy, you had the bourgeoisie, and you had the masses, the proletariat. So the bourgeoisie happened to be understood as the middle class, the class that you can see as the main force of the economic production of society. In other words, it was the bridging class between the elite and the masses. And if anything was going to happen at all in terms of economic force, it was coming through the bourgeoisie. So in later periods, the bourgeoisie began to be seen as an elitist class that defined the actual motivations of society and seen in the context of something far removed from the masses. In other words, something that had to do with the very rich, you know, the, the very affluent and definitely people that could decide how society could go. So in that context, Ferdinand de Saussure was seeing literature as being bound within this kind of bourgeois underpinning. And then he posited that literature should rather be seen from the context of science, from the context of a semiology, a science of science, where you could actually define a particular structure of a sign and then define also the characteristic, the features, and also be able to tell us what it entails. In other words, when you talk about a sign, it has a definite landscape. It has a definite way of being known as different from other signs. For example, signs could be involved in linguistic production, okay? It could be involved in cultural productions like fashion, like the movie industry, could be seen in the context of football, okay? And all these things are for the uh, the, 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 the semiologists, you know, social signs. That is, they give us a particular meaning of something you could identify in its own peculiarity as different from others. Now, in Saussure's idea of looking at literature, he felt that there was a need to look at the elements of literature as a science, a science whose structures and whose components could be understood as what gives it its meaning. Ferdinand de Saussure felt that, no, we needed to look at literature as a science that has its own particular structure, its own composites. By extension, what Saussure was doing was to begin to do what structuralists will see as studying language without speech. That is, he was looking at language minus speech. What that simply means is that language was seen as a particular structural element with its own system, a system that had its own consistency, which allows for the production of speech, by extension, the production of several ideas we apply language to. So in that context, Saussure had an identification of looking at literature as an element of language. And just as he looked at linguistics in the context of looking at language as a science, he also looked at literature as consisting of its own language, which he called la langue, the language, long. Long definitely is a French word as it is saw in literature as a component, a system of the lung that has a consistent, you know, mechanism of being known, of being critiqued, as different from la parole. Parole. The parole, you know, uh, happens to be the way in which language is used in society, the individual usage of language, the way in which language is applied to particular context of human or individual or societal happenings that were outputs that were allowed from the understanding of the elements of the lung. It's just like talking about language acquisition, okay, and the performance. When you talk about language acquisition in linguistics, you are talking about how language is acquired. Language becomes an element that is naturally 
ingested in human beings. Okay, that's why babies grow from childhood and they form into a linguistic society without going to school at all. Okay, so in, in linguistics, you call that kind of situation a function of the language acquisition device. But then, that the language acquisition device was different from the language learning device. Okay, the language learning device where you had to learn it with your brain working. So, what Saussure was saying was that la long, the long, okay, of literature allowed you to understand the way it works, just like language works, that allows a baby to get it without studying it, because language has a particular pattern of being transmitted and being ingested and being produced in society. You find out that you know the difference between tenses, between using a noun as different from a verb when using language normally, because it's not because you learned it, but because you actually acquired it. And the knowledge to be able to apply the past tense in the context of past experience and the present tense in the context of the present experience is the function of your understanding, or rather the ingestion of the system of how language is used. So for, for Saussure, the language as a system was paramount to the language as speech or as performance, which you see in parole. Now, when we look at that, applying this to literature, Saussure decided to look at literature as a scientifiable element, something you could slice into its components, put into its bits, and recognize as having this particular structure linking up with this structure linking up with this structure to create its own peculiar and massive structure of literature so in that context Saussure decided to segment literature as a part of the contemporary use of language as different from the past use of language language transmitted from one age to the other so for Saussure, what was paramount in structuralism was to look at language in its present elements as spoken today, not looking at it historically and looking at how, you know, maybe let's say Middle English has affected contemporary English. No, but he wants to look at contemporary linguistics, okay, in his own way. And then he applied that kind of idea on literature. So... When we talk about a structuralist analysis, we are dealing with how we look at literature as understood as a language system of the contemporary moment or of the moment of its actual temporal production. It's different from looking at literature as a kind of historical phase that is handed over from one point of generation to the other. By extension, Saussure looks at what he called a synchronic study, a synchronic study of language, and he applies that to a synchronic study of, you know, literature. He looks at that as being different from a diachronic study. Diachronic has to do with, you know, something evolving in historical time. But the synchronic has to do with something happening in present day history, in present day historical reflection or projection. Now, in looking at literature from a synchronic point of view, let's say you are holding your literary text like this, you are looking at the formation of that literature as something consistent with the language of its own age. And then you begin to look at the elements that make it fuse together as a literary production, as something you can understand, okay, as a story or as, let's say, ballad, a ballad poem, or as a piece of aesthetic production. What Saussure is concerned about is how do these things align? What are the elements that come into that? By looking at that, it does something. It looks at language as a grammatical element, an element of grammar 
And in looking at that, the longest simple element of language for the structuralist is the sentence. The sentence is the highest, you know, first category level of what you can associate with any language. It goes beyond the morpheme. You know, the morpheme is the smallest unit of linguistic meaning, okay? And then you also have the word. The word is the smallest unit of immediately understood language within society. The difference between the morpheme and the word is that while the morpheme is the smallest unit of a particular language system, it might not be something that is immediately understood in that language community. For example, you can have a morpheme like, let's say you have a word like unlearn unlearn you see learn is a word but unlearn is also a word the difference is that learn has just one syllable that is just one a beat production one sound beat production when you pronounce it as different from unlearn you have two beats production you have on learn so in other words a beat production will be a syllable while Anything going beyond that will be telling you it has two syllables, three syllables, and so on and so forth. Now, you find out that the word in learn has just one syllable, but the one in unlearn has two syllables. Of the two syllables, the on, the un, is a kind of attachment to the learn that makes it to mean the opposite of learn. That on, when you just pronounce on, in the spelling of UN in society, people won't understand what you are talking about. They might be mistaking it for ON. And ON makes meaning in English speaking community. But the UN before learn also makes meaning because at least it makes a different meaning from learn. That is a morphine. At the same time, learn standing on its own because you can't break it down into other limits can also be seen as a morphine because it is the smallest element you can find within that production. But the difference is that while a morphine can be a word or might not be a word, but it's definitely, you know, something that is the smallest unit, okay, in language, the word can consist of several morphemes, from one to two to three morphemes, okay? But it is always immediately recognized in the society. So what Sosu does with literature is that we should be able to understand the elements of the structures, the verbal structures, the, the noun structures, the nominal structures, the adjectival structures, and all that, that make the meaning of the text they should be analyzable okay you should be able to say this happens to this and that happens to that that's why we are able to make the sense of this now going a bit further the structuralists will tell you by the way structuralism is part of semiology semiology is a wider context of the play of science Okay, when we talk about semiology, we are, we are including all forms of science systems as being within a regular pattern of production that can be seen within structural elements. Okay, so that makes film a kind of science system, fashion a kind of science system, football a kind of science system, okay, literature as a form of science system. Now, looking at literature as a form of science system, okay, the structuralists will go on and tell us that the first things we look at in literature in doing a structuralist analysis is to identify the elements of the fact that, number one, every sign is in relation to another sign. In other words, a science system consists of the components of relations among the signs, okay? These relationships happen within what is also put within another kind of scale, which is called, okay, the scale of the syntagmatic relations of signs and also the scale of what is called the paradigmatic relation of signs. When we talk about syntagmatic relation of signs, we are talking about the way in which 
words, for example, couple together to make grammar, a grammatical syntactic meaning, which we can call a sentence. In fact, we can also talk about a syntagmatic relation in the area where phrases are also constructed. For example, if I say never again, even though it doesn't make a complete sense of what is really never again, but never again tells us something that we are not saying it will happen again. So by doing that, never again gives us a kind of syntagmatic relationship, a kind of relationship of words that are in a kind of correspondence, a kind of correspondence that we can read and make immediate meaning of. That kind of scale is seen as the horizontalist level of relation. For example, what makes us understand this kind of sentence? Literature is always a fancy to behold. That is the same. Literature is always a fancy to behold. Is the fact that there is an understandable relationship between literature and the next word and the next word that makes us have the idea that we are saying that literature is always a beautiful thing to be old. By extension, well, if we are now coming to another level of semiology to which another structuralist critic, Roland Barthes, we are coming to him now, identifies as mythology. He's talking about modern mythology here. That, okay, a relation can be given us in such a way that we have a literal understanding of what we are saying. Okay, for example, if we say literature is always a fancy to behold, it's giving us an idea of a primary level of meaning that literature is something we love to read. But that kind of element we have talked about can have another meaning at a deeper level. For example, when we place it within a particular context, let's say, for example, you are putting it in the context where you are making differences among disciplines. You are saying, perhaps to scientists or to archaeologists, okay, or to other people, okay, that literature is always a beauty to behold. You are not just saying that literature is something that is nice re uh, coming across, but you are probably saying that literature goes beyond what we face when we meet science or when we come to the area of natural science because you are probably saying that natural science is almost always abstract. So in comparison with literature, okay, uh, you are by extension saying that natural science is perhaps a problem to always come across because of its almost always already made abstraction. So when we talk in this context, the structuralist will tell us that the first level of meaning in language and by extension in literature is at the level of the syntagmatic relation of signs. By the way, a sign is always composed of two elements. Let's say a word like word, okay, is a sign. Or okay, let's put it in a better way or a more graphic illustration. Let's say a word like apple is a sign. It is apple because that is what the English-speaking people decide to call that particular element, that phenomenon we mentally understand as apple. When I pronounce the word apple in any English-speaking community, what comes to our mind is not a car, for example. It is not an orange. It is a particular fruit that everybody in the society knows as apple. Even though there could be species of apple, there could be, you know, regional, uh, you know, uh, differences of how we recognize apples. But apple will always be known as a kind of arbitrary uh, sign that brings us to understand that particular fruit. The word apple is in itself a sign. But the word apple is composed of what we call the signifier and the signified. The signifier is the sound, is the sound uh, uh, representation of what we are talking about. That is 
the particular issue, the particular substance called apple. Whereas what we are talking about, that is the concept that the sound apple relates to, that is the fruit itself, is called the signified. That is the signifier, what you have pronounced, is making sense of the signified. Together, it is a sign. And signs can move from a word to a phrase to a sentence to a discourse to a novel okay so when looking at that we see that as a relation of signs okay within that syntagmatic structure okay we see a way in which we make sense of particular ideas we are passing across in a particular linguistic production but then the meaning making of anything in language just like in literature is also related to the fact that it has not only associative relation with other signs, it also has a kind of relation that has to do with a subversion, a kind of relation that has to do with looking away from what is being said, a kind of relation of difference, of dissonance, a relation of opposition. What the structuralists will say that by saying that literature is always a beauty to be old, you are by extension saying that literature is not something that is maybe a tragic thing or something bad to come across or something that puts us off. And it is also by extension not saying that physics is something beautiful to be old by saying something you are by extension not saying something else so the differential relation between what you say and what you are by extension not saying makes a cogent meaning of what you are saying yeah we're continuing with this interesting exploration of structuralism in the next production but i want you not to forget certain things don't forget to like this channel don't forget to subscribe don't forget to share it and please drop your questions ask questions make your remarks your feedbacks thank you very much